me tell you, before we get into the, <laughs> the little red chairs, I played once in a convent where I attended school, my education. I played the mother the, in the miracle of Fatima. I played the Virgin Mary. <laughs> it sounds very nice. I was dressed in blue towel. I was on a series of butter boxes, one after the other. And I had to say nothing except with folded hands impart a message to the children of Fatima through some whispering uh, code. I did it for five nights pretty good. And on the sixth night, the Bishop of Galway, who would become indeed a non-friend of mine in my writing life, <laughs> Bishop of Galway was in attendance. And unfortunately, like Humpty Dumpty, I came tumbling down. <laughs> so if we have a repeat of that, I hope there are no bishops in this order. But it will be, um, it won't happen, that won't happen. The little red chairs, when, when we talk, when, uh, in a few minutes, I'll be able to tell you more about it or whatever questions that comes up between us both. But I'll read, you, I'll, I'll read you the first page or two. Uh, the gist of the story is a stranger comes to town, a man who, who uh, exudes enthrallment and mystery and a kind of holiness. So this is the first evening in the town. Little town, hamlet really. The town takes its name from the river and the current swift and dangerous surges with a manic glee, chunks of wood and logs of ice borne along in its trail. In the small sidings where water is trapped, stones, blue, black, and purple, shine up out of the riverbed, perfectly smoothed and rounded, and it is as though seeing a clutch of good-sized eggs in a bucket of water. The noise is deafening. From the slenderest twigs of the overhanging trees in a folk park, the melting ice drips, drips with a soft, susurrous sound. And the hooped metal sculpture an eyesore to the locals is improved by a straggling necklace of icicles, bluish in that frosted night. Had he ventured in further, the stranger would have seen the flags of several countries, an indication of how cosmopolitan the place had become. But he stays by the water's edge, apparently mesmerized by it, bearded, and in a long dark coat with white gloves, he stands on the narrow bridge, looks down at the roaring current, then looks around, seemingly a little lost. His presence, the single curiosity in the monotony of a winter evening in a freezing backwater that passes for a town and is named Clonyla. Long afterwards, there would be those who reported strange occurrences in that same winter evening. Dogs barking crazy as if there was thunder and the sound of the nightingale whose song and whose warblings were never heard so far west child of a gypsy family who lived in a caravan by the sea swore she saw the puka man coming through the window pointing an axe at her. So the next little moment is in the local pub which is not infrequent in small Irish villages. Dara, young man, spiked hair, plastered with gel, beams when he hears the lift of the latch the door latch and thinks a customer at last that the fecking driving drink lords business is dire married men and bachelors up the country parched for a couple of nightly pints were too afraid to risk it driving and guards watching their every sip squeezing the simple joys out of life evening sir he says as he opens the door sticks his head out remarks to the stranger on the shocking weather and then both men in some initiation of camaraderie stand and fill their lungs manfully. Dara felt he should genuflect. 
But he looked more carefully at the figure. Holy man, with a white beard and white hair and a long black coat. He wore white gloves, which he removed. Slowly, slowly, finger by finger, and looked around uneasily, as if he was being watched. He was invited to sit on the good leather armchair, and Dara threw a few briquettes on the fire and a pinch of sugar to build a blaze up. The least he could do for a stranger. The stranger had come to inquire about lodgings, and Dara said he'd put the thinking cap on. But then he proceeded to make a hot whiskey with cloves and honey, and for background music, put the pogues on at their wildest best. Then he lit a few old candles for the atmosphere. The stranger declines the whiskey. He wonders if he might have a brandy instead, which he swirls round and round in the big snifter, drinks, says not a word. There was no need. Dara, a blatherer by nature, unfolds in full gallop his personal history, just to keep the ball rolling. My mother, a pure saint, pure saint. My father, big into youth clubs, but very against drugs and alcohol. My little niece, my pride of joy, just started school. Has a new friend called Jennifer. I work two hours here at TJ's, and then at the castle at weekends, footballers. Footballers come to the castle, absolute gentlemen. I got my photo taken with one. Red Pele's autobiography, powerful stuff. I'll be going to England to Wembley later on for a friendly with England. We booked our flights, six of us. Accommodation in a hostel, bound to be a gas. I go to the gym, do a bit of the cardio on the plank. Love my job, love my job. My motto is... Fail to prepare, prepare to fail. <laughs> never drink on the job, never. But I like a good pint of Guinness when I'm out with the lads. Love the football, love the films too. Saw a great film with Christian Bale. Oh, he's the dark knight and all. <laughs> but I wouldn't be into horror now, no way. Well, that is the welcome and the... Uh, <laughs> garrulous welcome the stranger is given. Little does Dara or the waiting town know that the man who has arrived has indeed been into horror, but he has come in a different guise and he has come to set up life there as a healer and sex therapist. Everybody falls for him. The priest has a, a walk with him along uh, the Strand one morning to discuss um, the dangers of sex therapists, as you can well understand. And he said, it gives the wrong impression. The bishop has concerns. Well, of course the bishop has concerns. Not thinking of the bishop's own sex problems, but <laughs> the bishop has concerns. So uh, eventually, uh, the, the stranger, whose name is Dr. Vlad, bamboozles this young priest, and the priest feels he feels confirmed in the fact that this is a good man. So everybody is enthralled to the stranger, but in particular, yet I also write about love, or am accused about writing about love, so I might as well do it, is a young woman called, a married woman called Fidelma McBride, who married to a much older man and who very much all her life wanted to have a child, and it did not happen. Did not happen. She had a little shop, little French, uh, French type boutique, which has closed down because the financial crash has come. And gradually she makes her way into his life. First slowly, she has a little crush on him. She dreams about him. She dreams of him delivering a child to her in the bed next to her husband. So her dreams began to, to be adulterous, just as her life would be or her hope. And this is a short section because I'm more interested in our conversation. So I'm not going to read masses to you, but I have to fill in a little. This is a section in which she and Dr. Vlad, Fidelma, arranged to go separately to a very lovely hotel in the south of Ireland, away from where they would be seen. And romance takes place. So we put it that way. In the 
long ago in Victorian books, the, in Eleanor Glynn's books, it used to end at a very, very important chapter, and then they crossed the bedroom door. <laughs> so in this case, and then they crossed the bedroom door in this lovely hotel after some awkwardnesses and doubts and this and that. And he asks her, what Irish writer or poet has ever described the love of a man wooing a woman? And she talks of the playboy of the Western world in which Christy Mahan, the great, great boaster who said he killed his da, and of course he hadn't, and big pissy, but he hadn't. And Christy Mahan vowed to woo Peggy Mike and say he would kiss her out on the side of Nephew, onto her necklace. So, Dr. Vlad repeats the word, onto your necklace, and kissed her, and then they lay down, his body next to hers, seeking her with his hands, with his mouth, with his whole being, as if in the name of love, or what she believed to be love, he could not get enough of her. And afterwards, he spreads the strands of her hair and talks lovingly to her, and goes to the adjoining room, outside to the next room, where, which has been booked by her for him. In the morning, it was already, it was very early when he knocked on her door, but he was already, to her dismay, dressed to leave. He would not be staying for breakfast. She guessed it was caution, but she did not say anything. The coming weeks will answer all our questions, he said. Well, we will meet. We will meet again, she said. We must not get your story mixed up with my story, Fidelma, he says coldly. And what is your story, Vlad? She could barely disguise her dismay. My sacred duty is to God and my own people, he said in the words of a preacher. And she knows that whatever happened in the night is already annulled in the morning. She comes home to her husband, Jack, later that day. She drives from the south of Ireland to the north. Her husband, Jack, was waiting in the doorway, a reproachful look in his eyes because she was one hour late. He wore an old brown leather glove that was usually kept on a shelf in the potting shed and thrusting it at her he said look look then he opened it to reveal the ooze of a bat that he had squeezed to death two bats he said had come in in the night and when he got up and later went to wash his hands they were in the wash basin clung together like vampires the moment he touched them they began to fly big big circuits out of the bathroom into the hall up to the ceiling back and forth before his eyes in winding evil loops. He had to go outside, he said, and get the stepladder and stand on the top rung and hit one with the sole of his slipper to lure it down and eventually he belted it and squashed it to death, blood and pus spewing out like slime, black and bloodied, while the second one, the she-devil, had escaped through the window. I would have popped her too, he said. Such seething words from a man who had never harmed anyone in his life. Oh, poor Jack, she said. Oh, poor Jack, he said sourly, adding that he had not a wink sleep. And she coaxes him around to a goodish humor and says, although they're broke, because they've lost their shop, they would go to a hotel for dinner that night over to Renvile which is about 30 miles away, where they always go for their wedding anniversary. And long before they set out, he's rattling his coins in his pocket, he's asking her to hurry up, and how the sound of those footsteps, the rattle of loose change, his punctuality, his bursts of affection, how they now repelled her. The dining room where they sat, so contrasting from the previous evening with Vlad, Everything shabbier, frayed embroideries, dust in the folds of the taffeta curtains, faded photographs, little knick-knacks, everything falling into neglect and melancholy. And this was the world she was retreating from. 
From the two sherries, Jack's eyes had clouded, and he leant over her with a terrible and weeping ardour and said too loudly, far too loudly, that no man had a wife so beautiful and so constant. And that is where, in the story, things begin to go wrong. Things begin to happen and unfold fairly not too long after, in which she is with child, and the man she has chosen, the holy man, the poet, if Dr. Vlad said he was a poet, all is revealed that he is in fact a war criminal, that he is in fact responsible for thousands of deaths, for deportation for concentration camp, for starvation, for every kind of cruelty, for massacres, for sieges, and so on. And as it happens, he is captured, and she is in the village, not knowing how she will ever, ever tell people that she's carrying a monster's child. Not knowing. Her blood is sustaining it. She doesn't want it. But what happens, she is taken by some enemies of Dr. Vlad who have come the same day as he is captured, who have come to get the million that was on his head, but have also come to take some revenge on him because he betrayed them after war. So the woman is violated by those strangers. So in short, the strangers who come into that place bring nothing but harm and tragedy. And the man is caught, he is sent to The Hague, and she works, as a, she has to leave that village, she's disgraced, her husband will not forgive her, no one will forgive her, and, and none helps her to, 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 to get out, gives her a small bit of money, she comes to London, where she now finds her place, her new life, is among the homeless, the migrants, the desperate, the outcasts, and the people who still work, who have to, who cling to life by a hair's breadth, and she becomes one of them. But she has followed, naturally, because Dr. Vlad is proved to be the beast of Bosnia, and it's in papers, it's for everyone to read. And then, after a year in that life in London, where she makes some friends, and where she joins those people, and becomes one of them, in the dedication not to give up, not to give up, but also their lives are very hard, their lives are shorn. And she decides that she must, she must confront the man that she loved, and she did love him, and she believed he loved her. So she comes to The Hague, as indeed I went to The Hague Tribunal, and there he is in the court, with the same swagger, the same boastfulness, the same denial, the same lies, the same fluency, the same everything. And there he is protesting his innocence. And this short chapter, and I hope I haven't read, kept you too long, I don't think I have, I'm being good. Uh, at least I hope I'm being good. The prison was a few kilometers outside the center. She got a private pass to visit him in the prison. It was flanked by two tall towers, and though it was only four o'clock, darkness was descending, and the brick facade was the color of dried blood. Security was more strict than at the court, and she was passed from one guard to the next, their faces under the fluorescent right lighting, pallid and identical, sour and sullen, eyeing her with suspicion. He greeted her warmly, warmly, hands outstretched, let me look at you, Fidelma. Still beautiful. A little too thin, perhaps. And he seemed, with his excessive compliments, to be oblivious of the guard standing behind them. How are you, Vlad? He smiled at the recollection of his old name, his former name, and those days. There was a little metal table at which they sat, and already he had spread out a batch of papers. I brought this, she said to him. She took out a black chiffon scarf with the smell of verbena. 
with which he had blindfolded her, gestually on the night of their love. He seemed to ignore it. Don't you remember, she said. Don't you remember? And he, she held it up for him to see and maybe also to smell. He acted as if he did not understand her. You were in that court, Fidelma, he said, his voice booming now. You saw, you heard. They paint me as a monster. Then all the time I was seeking to create a homogenous piece. You know me, you knew me. In, your, in our personal association, did you find me a monster? Holding the scarf, she said, this is the only good memory I have of us, and then crushed it in her hand. I am a poet. I am an artist. I am a humanist, for Christ's sake. Caged in this stinking universe for crimes I have not committed, he is saying. I wanted to write to you, Vlad, but I did not know how to put it, she said, leaning closer. He is again shouting, oh, Kafka, Kafka, come back and help me overcome these shitty ladies and gentlemen enrobed in there in their high thrones, because truthfulness is dead, and I am the one who must prove that it is dead. The morning, he began, the morning you were taken off the bus, the news traveled like wildfire. TJ's was packed. People drove from all over to watch you on the big screen. There you were, the you they did not know, the you I did not know. Then witnesses from your country told their stories, and shoes were pelted at your face on the screen. Fifi fainted. Nothing of emotion registered on his face. He held up a sheaf of papers to show her. Not a single piece of evidence order, ordering atrocities was ever signed by me. The pages were scrawled, different inks, question marks, annotations. I was watching, she says, in my house with my husband. He knew nothing of our, of our love. For example, and he reeled off page and paragraph, D1329, D2335, D2986, D2168, D2170, D3302, D2172, D2605, and so on and so on. It was only a matter of will now, and alacrity. Who could outdo whom? I was 10 weeks pregnant, she said. There was no one I could tell, not even you. It's father. He looked at her and shook his head. How dare she compromise him in the presence of a god, a menial? I am not a nationalist, he said suddenly, addressing the god now. But I think races should not mix. When I meet a real Frenchman or a real German or a real Irishman, they have something that flowers have. They have a distinct, special scent of their own. It was, of course, being said to deflect her. But her anger was mounting. Three men, she began, knocked on the door, and my husband answered it. They had business with me, or rather they had business with you, whom they had come for. He went on, ignoring her. I have received many prominent awards as a writer. Also, I have written a comedy and a novel, Chronicles of the Night. They brought me up the mountain, she said, to a hut, a herd man's hut. One does not talk about a rope, Fidelma, in the house of a hanged man, he says. The one they call the medico took out a crowbar, she said, and you have to hear me out. You must not dramatize, Fidelma. My world in bits, in bits, and this child People who converse with God know that I am innocent. He is bellowing it into her ear. She can take no more. You know, you do know, Vlad, everything you have done. You do know it. And in a way, I wish you were mad. But you are not mad. You are one of Lucifer's lying liars. You are a monster. There's instantaneous eruption as he stands, papers flying in all directions. Wait, wait, out, out. 
He orders the guard in Dutch and in English. As she's gripped by the elbows from behind, the blades, both shoulder blades, it lifted in a clinch. She's marched out to where the burly guard is seated by the door, and together the guards talk in their own language, probably thinking she is a nutcase and should be placed under arrest. Outside, she eventually does get out after they have searched her handbag three times. The searchlight showed mist on the plot of grass over which she ran wildly, wildly, not once daring to look back, passing then a little row of dwellings, of houses with plants and china dogs in the window, up onto the road in search of a taxi, except there was none, then boarding the first bus that came along, with a hiatus as she could not remember the street, the name of the street where the hotel was. Then Hag, Holland Spoor, the driver said, shook her head. Saloon Boo, Rune Vaak, Den Haag. She was even more bewildered. To where do you wish to go? A woman in the front seat of the bus said. The center, she said. Central, the woman said. And the driver repeated it now. Central sounded like morning bells ringing jubilantly as the bus set out. But in the glass of the window, going through that leafy suburb, she saw her startled self. And then she saw his face appearing, floating out there, waiting. The vengeful eyes, the lip snarled to one side, weep, weep, out, out. And she huddled into her coat for protection. Thank you very much, and I'm sorry it was abbreviated. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Andrew. Now I'm going to. More sound, more silence. I thank you very much for that beautiful reading. Yes. I'm thrilled to talk to you. I'm thrilled you're back at the library. Welcome back. Thank you. Third time. Yeah. Third time back. <laughs> as, you're, uh, as you're reading laid out, one of the central kind of conundrums in the novel is this duality that we see in Vlad. He's both a healer and a destroyer. How can Vlad, this charming, poetic healer, be a man who murdered 11,541 people? What In one city alone. Right. Several thousands elsewhere. But sorry, how can he be both? Yeah, what was it like to imaginatively go into the psyche of someone like that? Well, it was not easy, is the first quick answer. <laughs> I was always surprised when I read you, uh, about a uh, Nazi um, generals and people who had gone to um, mainly South America and managed, or Klaus Barbie is one example, because I saw a film about him, and managed or pretended to live a very normal life. Cleaned the car on Sunday, invited people in on Christmas Eve. Normality, suburban normality in some place, under other names. I was always surprised that the hounds of guilt, remorse, etc., had not followed them, or they, that they did not break, they did not crack. So that has been in my mind from way, way back, that ability to totally, de not only deny, it's beyond denial, omit the previous life. I couldn't do it, I don't think, you could do it. I, uh, not an easy thing to do. But it shows the utter, utter ruthless treachery that, is, that man or woman, but in these instances man, is capable of. So that had intrigued me, but it was not the, it, what, it was not what stirred me to write the book. What stirred me to write the book was, first of all, a general feeling. I live, as everyone here does, in a very bloodied world. Oh, I sit down to dinner or have a cup of tea or a glass of wine 
or do what we call normal things. And I feel blessed, but I also feel, I feel a guilt, I think, is the word I would call it. I feel how lucky I am, and I feel the dangers of the world are there. They're in the atmosphere. They're in the ether. I'm not in a camp in the island of Lesbos. I'm not in Syria. I'm not in the places that we see on our screens. But we cannot omit them because we know they're there and we're shown them on the news and so on. So I had written always about, well, not all, not all utterly, but I'd written about private emotions which are valid, which are very valid. Tolstoy wrote Anna Karenina. He also, of course, wrote War and Peace. But about emotions between men and women and life and so on, and that is totally valid and must remain so. Because that is life. That is what life is in semi-normal situations. But I wanted to bring the world, the world of fear, the world of terror, the world of that kind of ruthless, merciless action to the world I knew. I could not set my book in Bosnia or in, in uh, The Hague or, or, or in Srebrenica or anywhere. I couldn't because I wouldn't know the landscape. I wouldn't know the, what the trees looked like. I wouldn't know the, how the river roared. And always with fiction as a reader uh, and hopefully as a writer, I very much want to have a, a, a story rooted in a totally credible place. And then one can say or do anything. So long as, as a reader, one is, you know, you've been brought into this place that isn't too daunting. And so I thought I will bring this particular war criminal because I saw him on television uh, the, the day he was captured, Radovan Karadzic, the day he was captured, having been seven years or maybe more in so-called hiding in Belgrade, where he was singing in bars every evening and reciting his awful poetry to the playing on the gulls of some instrument with a mistress. He had had a wife, but now he has a mistress. So everybody knew where he was, the police in Belgrade, but they had made no effort to give him up. They didn't want to give him up. They were loyal to him, even though they'd got rid of him. And then when the time came, politics, they wanted to join the European Union, and therefore one of the bargain chips is give him up. So he was taken, and the day he was taken, he didn't know he would be taken. Otherwise, he would not have set out with the Black Sea on a health holiday, which I wish I could go on myself. And he was taken off the bus, and I saw this figure, as I've described the man at first, this figure in the black long robe, with the ponytail, with the crystal, and with a total holiness and benignness to his persona. I thought, this is unbelievable. This transformation is in itself a kind of genius. So he intrigued me. I was also able to research considerably, his, even though you don't use it all. As Hemingway says, to write a story, you have to know everything and then throw most of it away. <laughs> so I was able to research and spoke to people from Bosnia and so on. That was one of the two things that finally got me to write the first sentence. And, that's, and the second thing that provided that was a person saying to me that Tolstoy had said once that all great stories have either one of two themes, that there's only two themes in the whole world. Now, maybe you know this, maybe you don't, but I'll have to tell you again. A man on a journey, which is Hamlet, or a stranger comes to town. And at that moment, the vision or the sight of the man being taken off the bus totally 
exceedingly. They said, you are not the man this, your papers say, you are so and so, and he said yes. So I brought the two things together and brought him to my, uh, not my native Irish village, but nearby, because I wanted a situation, as well as knowing my own turf, that there was a hotel, uh, and there is a hotel, there's more than one, with a lot of foreign workers from every country in Europe, some from Africa, but mostly Eastern Europe. And they tell stories at night, their memories of their own country, how they came to be there, the different countries they traveled through, the hunger they've had, ba ba ba. But one of them tells a story, and it's a great story, but he ends it with the following lines. He said, we're all friends here tonight. We're having a smoke, we're having a beer, we work together, we're lucky to be in Ireland. But you put us in a uniform, and we won't be the same people. And that's one of the truthful things about war. There's many other truthful things. But so I've set it near, these, where I come from, there's no posh hotel. So I set it near where the workers, where the hotel is and the workers. And now I will stop talking. <laughs> In the same way that we're amazed that a war criminal can just move on, start a new life, concern themselves with just domestic life, um, what was the impact of writing this book on your life in terms of the research you're doing, reading diaries, talking to refugees? How did that impact your life? It was long, and it was laborious, and in some occasions it was very satisfying. When you're doing research, oh sorry, I should sometimes look both ways, <laughs> hello. When you're doing research, in a way it's very satisfying because you think you're doing the writing. You're not. You're doing the field work, you're doing the groundwork. So my main, there were two, there were three parts to the research. I did not have to research Ireland and what the people working in the hotel always said because I knew them. I overheard them all the time and that was my s s starting post. I then read a lot, a great deal about this particular man and in a way, the most mysterious and troubling thing of how he and another man called Koljevic were Shakespearean scholars, were idealists, came from Montenegro to uh, Belgrade and wanted, according to themselves, to make the world better, to have people read Shakespeare. Well, they read Shakespeare. They read Shakespeare when they rode on bicycles through small villages. They swapped blood in order that they would always defend and be to get bonded together. So they were like many idealistic students, like people in a German novel, Young Toilers or whatever. And then the, except I believe it was always there, I don't believe people become killers. I believe if they, it's in the DNA there. I don't, even though the mask was great, they pretended to each other and to life. And when they swapped this blood up in the mountain, it was like that they would forever remain faithful to each other. They were not homosexual as it happened. They were, but they would be faithful to each other's ideals. Then the, the nationalism, you know, is a very fervent thing and it's also a very dangerous thing. The idea that not only would they defend their own country, which was not being attacked, but they would get territory, territory, territory. They would start a war. It was not enough because Yugoslavia broke up after Tito died. Tito kept a kind of iron hand communist, although he was not as communist as Joseph Stalin. So when Yugoslavia broke up into the neighboring, you know, Croatia, Bosnia, they saw that as a threat, that somehow 
even though they were the would-be conquerors, they began the war. They, be they believed that they were being assailed and attacked and supported before even it happened. So the war started very, there were skirmishes, there was a shooting at a wedding, but, and they used that as an excuse, because there was conflict, there's always conflict, as you know from the country you live in, and that I lived. So that ideal of nationalism, power, territory, conquer, that took over. And he and his friend Koljevic were, along with Milosevic and Mladic, they were the architects of it. And what they planned and the speed with which they planned it was absolutely merciless, merciless. People taken out of their houses, told to go across the bridge, to go anywhere. So as that was taking root, every then the other side, of course, began to rustle their armies, their guns. In short, a war began. And the Western world, this was part of my research, it is amazing and I, how American politicians and American diplomats, English politicians, English diplomats, did not really, and this is tragic, read the situation at all. They did not read it. Balkans, it was too far away. And they thought, oh, they're in fighting, they're all fighting with each other. But of course, it w they are fighting with each other. But conquest is what's at stake. And the brutality that then became brutality on both sides is unbelievable. But nobody quite understood it because he, when I read how he cajoled, impressed, and bamboozled the diplomats and the, more than the diplomats, the politicians who came, he was totally charming. He was totally convincing. He said, we are not the aggressors. While he was also planning, while this same politician, that he might have the airport bombed so that the politician would not get out or would be put down as an airplane catastrophe, not his doing. So he did, he not only did the slaughter, but he charmed and, and um, convinced the entire world and got away with it for a long time. He came to England, I, I, I knew he did, but I never saw him with his retinue. And he came with a man whose people were threatened. And the world believed it. And in my story, I have one chapter where he is asleep by a river bank. And his friend with whom he swapped the blood, Kodzigetsk, had, as the war began to go bad for them, at first it went great, but then they began to lose territory they had captured. Then the siege of Serebrinka, the world wakened up and saw that some, uh, the siege of Sarajevo and the massacre of 800 boys, Muslim boys, mother, uh, sons and husbands brought. And the Muslims in that country were quite different, if I may say so, to the Muslims in, the, for in Syria, Iraq and Bosnia. They were Turkish. Muslims, because Turkey occupied from the Ottoman Empire. And they and the Catholics of Croatia and the Orthodox of Serbia, there was, they all mixed together before this war happened. It wasn't that they'd been, it wasn't like the north of Ireland, that they'd been as its, you know, Catholics and Protestants. They mingled, they were together. So when the world began to see this, uh, history changed. But in my book, In the Dream, uh, his dead, his, his, his colleague who committed suicide, who shot himself, has for Dr. Vlad a full flashback of their life together, of what happened, and why he had to kill himself. Why he had to. He could not. He said, people say I was drunk when I killed myself. I was not. I could not take any more blood in my mouth. And he also says a thing which I think about friendship and friendship that is formed very early on in life. And very often at school and universities, they had pledged because they were mountain climbers and one or other, had, one had said to the other, 
The thing is, when you climb the mountain with your comrades, you never let go of the rope. And he says to him in this dream, in which he recounts, he's his conscience, if he had a conscience, but the line he says, of, you let go of the rope. And then I, so that was one part of the research. And the other part, um, all of that, that took time, was part two of the book, which is set in London with refugees and their stories, and their stories as I heard them in various centers, but one center in particular, were so truthful, they were so searing, they were so, or they are, so human. The small thing, a little beautiful African girl in a house with 17 other people, all waiting for the letter from the Home Office in England to say they can stay. This, they're all down at the doorway every morning for the envelope. 17 people who don't get on that well. And they're down at the, waiting for the letter. Each one, you know, if one person got a letter, the other person saying, no, that's my letter. That's addressed, I mean, quarreling. And they had very little, they got a little money from the English, uh, very little to eat. And I said, what do you eat? As she had to, she said, rice in the morning and rice at lunch and rice with sauce in the evening. And just that particularity of how someone lives, listening to LBC on the radio in her room, waiting for the letter. And yet this is the story she told me. I said, what would you most want in the world, Rosalind? Thinking she would say, I want the letter from the home office. I want a boyfriend. I want something to eat other than rice. I want to be able to have the money to go to the pictures in, 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 in London, etc." She said, no, I want my mother to forgive me. And that I found so touching that along with all that was happening politically to her was the old human need and connection for mother, for home, for attachment. In fact, in that second part of the book, where part two, where Fidelma is in London working alongside the refugees, you've given them a tremendous amount of space to tell their stories. Sorry, yeah. And it reminds me, um, in your book on Byron, you preface the book with these words. But words are things, and a small drop of ink, falling like dew upon a thought, produces that which makes thousands, perhaps millions, think. I wonder if you would comment on your role as a teller of stories. Just show me. I, I, don't, I couldn't hear that very well. Oh, bad. sure. Can I see it? Yeah. yeah. Did I see it? Or did someone else? <laughs> Where is it? It's at the very bottom. It's a. Uh, but you words are things. Yes. Ah, yes. And a small drop of ink, falling like dew upon a thought, produces that which makes thousands, perhaps millions, think. Is that by somebody else, or is it by? That's you? by Byron. And by who? By Byron. Oh, by Byron, of course. And you prefaced and your book with those words on Byron. And I wonder if you would comment on your role as a storyteller in giving these refugees the space to tell their stories. Um, I believe that very much, and words do make. I wish any longer it was millions, it's dwindling. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody here can be put blamed for that, but readers of, real, of serious literature are dwindling, as we know, and that's a great shame, and that's something with my remainder Joan of Arc blood I fight for. <laughs> uh, we, literature, words, words carefully, cogently, miraculously, both consciously and unconsciously chosen are miracles. Literature is a huge thing. Great literature has been a great gift to us from the Iliad to present time. I. The only comment I could make is that when I'm asked by younger people who are starting to write, or when I'm talking to myself, they say, 
how can I be, how can I be it? And I say, read and reread the great books. So that may seem an indulgence in a world where there are many other needs, considerations, and problems. However, I believe that great literature, that is to say, that great assemblage of words carefully, rigorously, and lovingly chosen, that that can have an effect on the soul and the psyche of people. It's not just entertainment. It's not just airport reading or whatever the cliche words are. Literature enriches one. It makes one feel more. It makes one feel deeper. That feeling may not last and extend into life every single day, but it does change one. The first time I ever saw King Lear I was absolutely, I could not believe it. I could not believe that so profound a story in language, in plot, in um, interaction of people, a story so simple. A king decides to give up his throne. He divides it between his three daughters, and then one doesn't prove love. As a result of that, there's war, there's treachery. All I can summarize it by saying why Byron is so right is that we feel deeper when we read something deep. We are enriched when we read something great. And we are taken when we read from our own little, urgent, ongoing, mental, what I call laundry list, <laughs> of ourselves. Of course we have worries, but reading, if it's good at all, reading makes one deeper and makes one understand human life, often in a way that human e intercourse or exchange doesn't make us understand it. I, I believe that. I may be wrong, and when we have questions, maybe someone will tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> Uh, your work is a testament to a lifetime devoted to literature. And yet, um, there's this perception of you having this legendary social life. I know. It's but, yes. but you've often said, and most writers do, that writing requires a solitary life. Of course it does. Uh, I wonder how far is the distance between the legend and the reality? <laughs> well, <laughs> big distance, <laughs> big distance. <laughs> What it is, is I, in one chapter of my memoir, I wrote about a short period in my life, which I called Nocturnes, in which my life was a little bit heady. I met movie stars, God knows how. I don't meet any movie stars now. People came to my house. It was in the 60s. I loved giving parties. I uh, could give great parties. Spent everything I had, but that's another story. <laughs> And somehow out of that small um, part of that book came, the, and sometimes earlier on, some newspapers in England because I might go or be seen at a party. They sort of exaggerated, disproportionately anyhow, the life I was living, bringing up children alone, and the working all day, and the occasional gallop as Virginia Woolf might call it, <laughs> out into social life. And I remember one person talking to me about it. At a, it was at a New Yorker dinner, and it, he was an English writer. And he said, oh, you live this. Um, he, was, he was kind of sneering about it. I said, could I, could I address this for a moment? You read something in a magazine or a social um, column, something, there are 365 days, nights in the year. Perhaps I was at one of those, or two or those. Five nights would have been the most. So let us get the balance. Let us get the truth. I could not have written, by that, at that point, I suppose I'd written 14 or 15 books, if I was leading this life. But I wish I had, if you like, the 
robust energy that certainly Lord Byron had, but then he did <laughs> die very young, <laughs> to engage totally in both lives, social life, out to dinner, the life of dedication, alone in the room, trying, trying, trying to get the word. I wish I had that. I do not. And I do not believe that it is possible. The writers I love, and one I knew was Samuel Beckett, and he is a great writer, not just to me, but to many. And his writing is so funny, uh, so daring, so arresting, but also so sacred, like the book of Job. Now, he lived as one example. He's reputed to, to be both a hermit and yet meeting people all the time. Well, you can't be both. But he's reputed to have been both, and of course, he was not. What I think is the loneliness that it requires, not only to become a writer, but to remain a writer, is part of the price that one has to pay. You have to pay. Because when I'm writing a book, as with the little red chairs, I'm writing it not just when I'm at the desk with the pen doing it. If I go to the shops to buy something, if I have to see someone, it's still with me. Because when you're writing a long work, well, a short one too, like a short story, but it doesn't take as long. But when you're writing a long work, and if it's a work that's very intense and intricate and involves strands of many parts of life, you can't really go away from it because the fear always is of losing it. It is a pregnancy of the mind, of the soul, and you have to keep with it, which is both wonderful, you know, I wouldn't change it, hard as I find writing, I wouldn't if I were born again and the angel said, what do you want to be? I would say, a better writer. <laughs> so I would keep with it and will keep with it for as long as I'm on earth. But I know that it is very easily squandered or lost. It lost through too much social life. It's lost through enormous and disproportionate fame because writers stop believing, they're, they stop meditating with the truthful things when they become very famous. They believe what others, uh, you know, people, fawners, people who fawn over them and flatter them. They believe what those people say, not the inner terror that causes one to write. Because to write is a radical thing. It's, it's a difficult thing. And it's a thing in which you have to be totally honest with yourself and with those words. And that's not how society works. It's not. Society, as Oscar Wilde and all other great satirists, and to this day, society exists to a great extent, parties or you know, party, it exists on a kind of pleasant lie. <laughs> and writing isn't a pleasant lie. It's an unpleasant truth. And sometimes enchanting. It's not all unpleasant, but it's getting to the marrow. It's getting to the absolute, unassailable truth. And that's what makes writers, if I may be a little giddy for a moment, it is why writers tend to drink. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, when the President of Ireland was bestowing the honor of the sea on you last year, he called you a fearless teller of truth, quite a change in tune for the Irish government. Um, so I thank you very much for your work, and I'm so sorry we're out of time this evening. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Edna O'Brien. Thank, thank you very much.